And, uh, and I think that's an important, important notion these days to, uh, to nurture. Thank you, David. Thank you, Troy, and accompaniment. Thank you, Mike, back there with AV. And thank you, Chris, uh, and she's uh, taking care of the youth. And, and thank you, Latrell. And I believe she's probably with them for, uh, for uh, making service happen and for me to be uh, integrated into the worship today with you. What I have to <coughs> share with you <coughs> is a set of stories that basically portray a, a verbal portrait of Jesus, of Nazareth, of Jesus Christ, and, and something that uh, actually has happened over a period of time uh, since I was in seminary. I'll talk a little bit more about, about uh, these stories and their significance, but just that uh, it's a set of stories that came to me over time, and... Uh, and help provide a, a story in, together about how Jesus evolved what was inside of him to come out and be expressed as the Son of God, the Son of Man, uh, the one who is Christ. Friends, hear now the stories. In the beginning of the good news about Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who descended from God, as it was attested to by Isaiah the prophet. Look here, I am sending out my angel to confront you, who will pave your way. A voice declares in the wasteland, prepare the way of the one who is. Make the path straight for God. John the Baptist appeared in the wasteland, and he announced the baptism for the changing of one's heart and mind in order to forgive and be forgiven of sins. And people journeyed out to him from the whole region of Judea, especially from Jerusalem, and they were baptized by him in the waters of the Jordan, confessing their selfish thoughts and deeds. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and girded about the waist with a leather belt. And he ate locusts and honey from wild bees, and he publicly proclaimed, After me is coming one who is more powerful than I, the thong of whose sandals are not worthy to stoop down and untie. I am baptizing you by water alone, but he will baptize you in a great spirit, the life breath of holiness. And then in those days Jesus came from Nazareth of the Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And instantly, as he ascended from the waters, he saw a splitting open of the, of the heavens, and the great spirit, like a dove, came down to him. And a voice came from the open heavens. You are the one who comes from me. You are one who is beloved. In you I delight. Right then, Jesus turned back from the Jordan and was urged on by the great spirit into the wasteland of being tempted by one's own worst enemy. For 40 days and 40 nights, Jesus did not eat anything, and at the end of it, he was ravenous. So the enemy said to him, If you are a son of God, speak to such as that stone so that it becomes bread. But Jesus answered, It is because of such as this that it is written, Humanity does not live by bread alone, but by every word that God is still speaking. And Jesus was led up to be shown all the nations of the world in an instant. And the enemy said to him, To you will give the power of this whole domain and its splendor. It was given over to me to give to whoever I wish. Here is my foot to kiss, and yours will be all this. But Jesus answered, It is written, You shall worship the one who is your God. Who alone is worthy to be served? And Jesus was led into Jerusalem and placed at the top of the temple. And it was said to him, If you are a son of God, jump down from here. For because of this it is written, God's angels are around you to protect you. And this, you'll be born up so that you not even bump yourself against a stone. But Jesus answered, It is spoken. Stop tempting the one who is your God. 
that the temptation stopped and the enemy backed off to try again. But Jesus returned in the power of the great spirit, the life breath of holiness. And his reputation went out through the whole vicinity. And he preached in the synagogues there and was praised by everyone. Jesus resolved to go throughout the Galilee, and he happened to find Philip, and he said to him, Come along with me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the hometown of Andrew and Peter the Rock, who is sometimes called Rocky. <laughs> Philip happened to find Nathaniel, and he said to him, The one who Moses wrote about in the law, and the prophets in their writings, Jesus Josephson from Nazareth. Nathaniel said, Nazareth? Can anything worthwhile come from there? Philip said to him, Come see for yourself. And Jesus saw Nathanael coming towards him and said about him, Well, look here, a true Israelite in whom you can trust. Nathanael said to him, Now how would someone like you know anything about me? Jesus answered him, Before Philip called for you, you were under the fig tree. I saw you. Whatever it was that happened under the fig tree, it must have been some crisis of loyalty and truth because Nathanael answered him, Oh, Rabbi, you're the Son of God. You're a king. You're an Israelite like one of us. And Jesus said, Because I said I saw you under a fig tree, do you trust me? You will see greater things than this. You will see the heavens having been opened and the angels of God ascend and descend in the presence of the Son of Man, the true heir of humanity. And Jesus came back to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as it was his habit on the Sabbath day, he went to synagogue. And uh, he got up to read publicly and was given the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. And on rolling the book, he happened to find the place where it is written. The Spirit of the one who is God rests upon me to anoint me to preach good news to poor people. I am sent to proclaim amnesty for captive people and the recovery of insight to proud blind people. I am sent to heal in order to forgive and to forgive in order to heal. I am sent to proclaim a year of reconciliation with the one who is God. Rolling up the scroll to give back to the attendant, Jesus sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were riveted upon him. And he began to say to them, Today these words are fulfilled as you hear. But everyone was complimenting him. And amazed at the elegant words that proceeded from his mouth, then they said, Isn't this Joseph's son? <laughs> and he said to them, More than likely you will quote to me this proverb, Physician, heal thyself. And you will say, what we here do did at Capernaum, do here for your own people. I tell you the truth, no prophet is ever politically correct in one's own hometown. In all honesty, I say to you, there were many widows in Israel at the time of Elijah, when there was no rain for three and a half years, but there was a terrible famine throughout the land. Yet he was sent to none of them except a woman who was widowed, of Zarephath, of Sidon, of Lebanon. And there were many lepers in Israel at the time of Elisha the prophet, but none of them was healed except Naaman of Syria. All who heard this were outraged. They seized him and dragged him out of the synagogue, the very brow of the cliff in which the city was built. They went to throw him head first over the side, but cutting through their midst. Jesus got away. There was a wedding in Cana of the Galilee. Jesus' mother was there. Jesus also was invited, along with some of his friends. When they ran out of wine, his mother said to him, They are out of wine. Jesus said to her, Ah, woman, what do you want me to do about it? Mother, it doesn't seem to be the time for me to do this sort of thing. His mother said to the servants there, Whatever he says to you, do it. 
Now, six carved stone jars were standing nearby, used for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding between 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, Fill the jars with water. So they filled them up. And he said, Now draw some out and take it to the master of ceremonies. So they did it. When the master of ceremonies tasted the water, now supposedly changed to wine, did not know where it came from, though the servants who drew the water knew. The master of ceremonies sent for the bridegroom, and he said, Most people serve the good wine first, and after everyone is drinking a lot, then the cheap stuff. But you are only just now starting to serve the best wine? Jesus performed his first symbolic act in Cana of the Galilee and demonstrated his glorious sense of humor. And his light and his friends were likewise transformed into disciples. And Jesus came back to Capernaum after a few days. And when it was reported that he was at home, so many people were gathered there that it was not possible to get through the door. And he was preaching the word of God, the way to live to them. Then they came, four people carrying a paralyzed person. And when they could not reach Jesus through the crowd, they climbed up on the roof. And when they had dug down and torn open a hole big enough, they let down the stretcher on which this paralyzed person lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to this paralyzed person, My dear, your sins are forgiven. <laughs> now, some of those who are also sitting there disputed with one another, saying, What is this? This is blasphemy. Who can forgive sins if not God alone? Right then, Jesus knew that they were debating about this with each other, and he said to them, Why do these questions arise in your hearts? Which is easier to say to a paralyzed person? Your sins are forgiven, or maybe get up and walk. Ah. But so that you may know the Son of Man, the true heir of humanity, has the power on earth to forgive sins, he said to that paralyzed person, I'm telling you to get up, pick up his stretcher, and go on home. And that person got up, picked up a stretcher, and practically danced out the front door so that they were astonished, and they said, Praise God! God, we never saw anything like this. Praise God. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain. And he sat down when his disciples had climbed up and were before him. And from his lips came this teaching. To be ripened are those who are challenged by poverty and disability, for theirs is the beloved community of heaven. To be ripened are those who suffer, for they shall be healed. To be ripened are those who are humbled, for they shall win it all in the end. To be ripened are those who hunger and thirst for justice, for they shall be satisfied. To be ripened are those who are merciful, for they themselves shall receive mercy. Be ripened are those who are pure in intention, for they shall see God in action. To be ripened are those who are peace builders, for they shall be called the children of God. To be ripened are those who are persecuted for the sake of justice, for theirs too is the beloved community of heaven. To be ripened are those of you who be cursed, persecuted, and accused of all kinds of terrible things, ah, falsely on my account. Rejoice and anticipate the great reward that awaits you in the heavens. For the prophets were abused in the same way. You all are the salt of the earth, though unseasoned becomes tasteless. With what shall it be made savory again? For it is good for nothing. But even then it can be thrown out on slippery walkways. You all are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and places it under a basket, but on a lampstand, shining forth to all those in the house. In this way your light must shine forth in the sight of all humanity, that they may see your good works and your praise for your beloved guardian who is in the heavens. Amen.
pandemic has given us an opportunity for renewal as a nation and as a church. The events of 2020 have shown us that this has come at a terrible cost, giving us 2020 perspective on the injustice and neglect of many decades. The whole world is burning with ancient rivalries, war, environmental disaster, economic collapse, famine, unprecedented numbers of refugees, all made worse by a plague. One thing that we all have, even though, is our stories. That is what holds communities and families together and what keeps us all going no matter what we are, no matter who we are or where we are on life's journey or the political spectrum. My counsel to others for living in these times has simply been this. Know your narrative. Listen with a willingness to learn. Question civilly, stay engaged, act, vote, speak up. Know your narrative. For Christians, that is the gospel, the good news, and specifically the words and deeds of Jesus of Nazareth. The early church had the speeches and letters of the apostles, as well as the fellowship of their congregation to nurture them until Christ's triumphant return while waiting under the domination of the Roman Empire. When the apostles Peter and Paul, as well as others of the church, were executed, the people knew they had to do something before all their leaders, eyewitnesses, and storytellers died out so that the faith would continue. The first gospel Gospel of Mark was written for the people of the future. It was written for us. Other Gospels were written, with Matthew and Luke following the storyline of Mark. But, like John, they tailored their message for their particular audience at the time. Now today, I've given you a booster shot for knowing your narrative with stories I have been telling for many years now, which I have paraphrased word for word to unpack, to unpack the terms we have taken for granted and find new meaning by using inclusive language and help show how God is still speaking in our time. As I said, the pandemic has given us an opportunity for renewal as a nation and as a church we need to know our narrative, listen with a willingness to learn, question civilly, stay engaged, act, vote, speak out. First, you have to know your narrative. You have to know what you believe. You heard me share selections from each of the Gospels telling about the beginnings of Jesus' ministry. So what did you hear? What did you hear in a new way? Do you agree with my interpretation? What do you suggest? While I was at Lancaster Theological Seminary in Pennsylvania, where I began to experiment with biblical storytelling, we had a Roman Catholic priest who taught spiritual direction. Father Ed Sanders, SJ, that's a Jesuit, encouraged me saying, be aware of the stories that come to you to tell. Well, that is exactly what happened as I found myself being invited to tell a particular story or looking for one that dealt with a particular theme. In time, I realized I had a set of stories that describe how Christ evolved in the sense that what was inside of him was brought out and that he grew through confrontation like any of us. You see, the gospel stories of Jesus serve as a window to God's divinity and a mirror for our humanity, our human potential. We see the character of God this way, where he is, through the words and deeds of Jesus, when he is wise, courageous, compassionate, 
healing and even humorous. There are also characteristics for us to compare with our own humanity and to imitate Christ in our lives, ironically, as a way to truly be ourselves. And then we, we see that Jesus can get angry, discouraged, uh, that he gets, he gets pushed to the limit, right? But also we see a way through those things through him. And here are some details that have emerged for me over time in the telling of these stories. At Jesus' baptism, he re receives an affirmation of his identity from God. And immediately he is sent into a wasteland where his identity will be challenged by Satan, the enemy. That's what the word means, literally, the enemy. Jesus quotes scripture in response to each temptation. But when scripture is used against him, he speaks for himself. From the heart, from who he is. And the temptations came to an end. Jesus happened to find Philip and Nathanael as he began to call disciples to him. At first, Nathanael was hostile to Jesus because he was from Nazareth, which I've been told was predominantly a Samaritan village. However, when Jesus said he saw Nathanael under a fig tree, which is a symbol of national pride, Nathanael was amazed and became a follower. This is also the second time when a reference is made to the opening of the heavens for divine encounter. Jesus' sermon at Nazareth outlines his mission of liberation, healing, and reconciliation. Jesus also affirmed inclusive language, literally identifying a woman who was widowed, and not simply as a widow. When he was slighted by his hometown people who knew him, he gave it right back to them, but he was almost killed for it. At the wedding in Cana, we see Mary's continuing influence in her son's life. In this instance, to encourage him to be all he can be. When I tell this story together with that of which he was rejected at Nazareth, it would seem that Jesus had been discouraged and that he may have felt the time to demonstrate his powers had not yet come, but he rises to the occasion. And I, I love making that, making that connection of the role that Mary plays as that person in your life who says, you can do this. Here's the ball, run with it. Those people who believe in us. We also see Jesus' capacity for humor as he responds to the shortage of wine by providing an enormous abundance of wine. The healing of the paralyzed person was one of the first biblical stories I ever learned. It has that marvelous detail of these four companions who could not get their injured friend to see Jesus any other way except by tearing a hole in, in Jesus' mother's house, the, the roof, <laughs> and uh, to, in order to lower him into the house. It took me many years to recognize, I've been telling these stories for a while, but it took me many years to recognize that the same gesture, the baptismal tearing open of the heavens, the angels who would ascend and descend in the presence of the Son of Man, and tearing open the roof to let down this, the friends who had climbed up to lower their, their beloved one for healing, <laughs> and that, that, that just happened to be there. And uh, a happy coincidence to discover. Finally, the Beatitudes are the prologue to Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. They're not just a list, but suggest a cyclic path that begins and ends with the beloved community, God's kingdom on earth, 
as it is in heaven. And this is significant because it provides an example as a countermyth. It is actually a storyline, a countermyth in sharp contrast to the hero's journey, which too easily gets corrupted into violent retribution. I love Joseph Campbell. I love the power of myth. He talks about uh, the hero's journey, but there is a distinction. Walter Wink, Rene Girard, uh, they speak of, of how uh, uh, this, uh, Walter Wink in particular, says that the hero's journey can be compared to the Western, Star Wars, and Popeye cartoons. Okay. Bluto shows up, terrorizes the town. He abducts uh, olive oil. Popeye's the stand-up guy. He tries to rescue off, uh, olive oil. Boom, he gets clobbered. And then, and then off he goes. And then, uh, and then all of a sudden, the spinach shows up. Da 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 da. Boom. Popeye clobbers Bluto, rescues olive oil, and they all live happily ever after until next week's episode. But we see that, that this, unfortunately, the use of violence, sanctified violence in the hero's journey, slaying the dragon, that that story can be corrupted by those who think they are saving, well, Dylan Roof, killing nine innocent people, thinking he's saving white civilization. The counter myth says it begins and ends with the beloved community, it begins and ends with persecution, with a challenge, but it, there's a ripening. A friend taught me, uh, told me about a, a, another way of thinking of, of blessed are is as a ripening, a preparing. And the various challenges, it goes from being, from, uh, being a victim to then being proactive. It comes right back to being persecuted again, but then that story just starts all over again. And that's the story that Jesus lived out. With these samples from each of the Gospels harmonized to paint a portrait of Jesus Christ, my hope has been to encourage you to learn more about Jesus and re-examine what you believe about God. Richard Ward, who is the keynote, was the keynote speaker this, uh, this summer for the Network of Biblical Storytellers Virtual Festival Gathering, said that we must remember what is sacred about our faith. And to know the story, to know your narrative. And, and let me just put it this way. What is the story that stands out for you? Maybe it's not a biblical story. Maybe it's a song, even. What is that, that story that is a guiding vision for you? What stories keep coming back? What is the story that comes to you? In this way, you can grow in confidence because you will know your narrative as a Christian and not be afraid to listen to others who push their narrative you can question them if need be. And you will be able to stay engaged in the conversation and speak up when you must. Amen.